Welcome to the New School. My name is Lisa Servan, and I am Dean of Milano, the New School for Management and Urban Policy. I am also a proud parent and consumer of the New York City Public School System. So it's really great to be hosting this event today. This promises to be an exciting morning. The Center for New York City Affairs, a policy research institute that's based within Milano, has released its latest report on the city's public schools, which you all have in front of you, hopefully, titled The New Marketplace, How Small School Reforms and School Choice Have Reshaped New York City's High Schools. My daughter is stepping up from kindergarten this week, so we have a few years to fix all the problems, at least in my household. Um, this morning, we'll learn about the researchers' findings and discuss them with a panel that represents a wide range of people involved with the city's high schools. And we'll hear from school's chancellor, Joel Klein, about his vision for the future of New York City's high schools and about the next phases of the transformative work with which he has made his mark. Before we begin, I want to thank the people who made our report and this morning's program possible. So first, let me acknowledge the Cyrus Fund and its president, Susan Halpern, who is also a Milano board member and alumna of Milano and a trustee of the New School. I also want to recognize the Ira W. DeCamp Foundation and Lisa Philp, the United Way of New York City, Juanita Ayala and Jennifer Jones Austin, and finally, the Milano Foundation. And I also want to acknowledge a couple of other good friends in the audience who are members of the Milano Board of Governors. One is Steve Nislik, and the other is Lori Slutsky, who's an alumna and our former chair. Please join me in thanking and applauding all of them for their support. We often speak in these public programs about the importance of reform and innovation in public policy. And it's true, innovative policies can reshape the way people experience government and improve government's effectiveness. But innovations, as we all know, also challenge managers in the public sector and in scores of nonprofit organizations. At Milano, we teach the skills that lie at the intersection of policy and implementation and the skills managers need to improve their organizations and better serve communities and families in need. Our students take on real life problems in urban policy and management. Our school is as much about learning from experiences and experience as it is about lecture courses and readings and seminars. In fact, um, two of our students are in the audience today, Lorraine Garrison and Amy Caudill, maybe more of you, who did a, a great piece of work this spring for the Citizens Budget Commission and presented some of their findings to Chancellor Klein yesterday. So we are really trying to match the work that we do on the ground with policymakers. The Center for New York City Affairs is a critical part of our school. Its research and coalition work is designed to learn the lessons of management and policy on the ground and to take these lessons to public, to practitioners and policymakers. The center's new report, which many of you are here to learn more about today, explores some of the city's cornerstone initiatives on education and explains what they have meant for students, particularly those most at risk of dropping out of school. You should have a copy in your hand, and in just a moment, you'll hear a short presentation of the findings from Clara Hempel. But first, we are honored to have with us today the Chancellor of New York City School System, Joel Klein. Ch <laughs> just a minute, I'm going to say a couple things, but yes, you can skew can applause. <laughs> yes. Chancellor Klein is the longest serving schools chancellor in recent New York City history. He currently manages a system with more than 1,500 schools, with more than 1 million students, 136,000 employees, and an $18 billion operating budget. His leadership includes a number of remarkable accomplishments, including a huge increase in the resources allocated to the school system since he and Mayor Bloomberg came into office in 2002. In recent years, the city's public schools have significantly increased graduation rates and increased teacher pay to a level that is more competitive with the surrounding region. The Department of Education has created more than 200 new small high schools and broadly expanded school choice, two of the topics that are explored in the center's new report. The DOE has also argued for mayoral control and accountability of principals and staff at the school level. Not surprisingly, these arguments and initiatives have been met with some controversy. But Chancellor Klein was not hired to avoid controversy. 
Depending on the point of view, opinion makers have described him as, quote, a passionate reformer or, quote, a driven zealot. It is clear that Chancellor Klein has sought to create a school system where family poverty and a child's lack of economic opportunity uh, do not compromise the quality of his or her uh, educational options. So today, we will have the opportunity to discuss whether or not his department's initiatives have brought his vision closer to reality, what this work has meant for the city's high school students, and what we should expect to see happen in the coming year and possibly beyond. Please join me in welcoming Chancellor Joel Klein. Thank you, Lisa, and thank Milano for the opportunity. Uh, let me thank Andrew and the Center for New York City Affairs for bringing us all together. Uh, I, and also, Lisa, I want to thank you for giving a shout out to Lauren and Amy, two of the students that I had the privilege to meet with yesterday, who were really as thoughtful and as, as comprehensive in their analysis as almost anybody that's presented to me in recent times, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. It's a tribute to the work you're doing here at the school. Let me also say, uh, Lisa used that word, which uh, somehow got affiliated with my name, which is uh, that I've generated some controversy. Uh, you know, when the mayor introduced me now seven years ago, he said uh, I would make the tough and sometimes controversial decisions necessary to change public education. Well, he's called me recently and reminded me that he said sometimes controversial, not always <laughs> controversial, but of necessity, when you're talking about people's children and you're talking about transforming a system that everyone in this room agrees needs to be transformed, that the outcomes have to be entirely different for every kid in every community of every color and from every background, you're gonna have to do tough and yes, often controversial things. And that's why I'm glad we're here today because one of the tough and controversial things has been carefully analyzed in this report by Clara Hemphill, Kim Nauer, Helen Zellin, and Thomas Jacob. And I wanna thank all four of you, both for your commitment to public education and for the energy and, and the real time and thoroughness that went into this report. As you will hear, I have some disagreements with certain conclusions, but I do want to say this report is really a report for all of us to read carefully, to look at, to think through, and move the discussion forward. And that's what's going to help this city and ultimately this country transform public education. You've got a great panel. Uh, I'll, you'll hear a lot of varying views from your panel. I just want to set the table with three or four things that I think are important, both looking at the report and also looking forward in New York City. Let me start with the report. It's, it's fundamentally three things, and the third trans sort of enables me to transfer to a looking forward vision. First thing about the report, and I think it's very important, is it carefully documents the fact that new small schools in the city, and we've opened some 200 plus while we've shut down major large schools. The new school, small schools with the same children, no creaming, all documented in the report, are getting different results, significantly different results. That is powerful. It's powerful in two dimensions. One, we're talking about kids who came to high school in many instances far behind. And I'm gonna come back to the importance of that point. Too often, people focus on a high school only strategy. That will not get us there. But with those very same kids who are going to Evander and who are going to South Shore and other places, what you're seeing now is different outcomes. And that's so important because for too long, we excuse the non-performance of public education based on kids, poverty, and all the other excuses. I'd be the first to say we all need to do a lot more and a lot better. But the fact that we're getting very different results matters. Now the report indicates in the second year the results fell off a little bit. Uh, and I, I have third year data and often fourth year data for our schools. And what we're seeing in the new small schools is that the results consistently are higher for the same cohort of students than were in the schools that they replaced. And they're now stabilizing at about a 70%, 71% graduation rate, which is very different from the schools that they replaced, many of which had a 30 or a 35% graduation rate. 
So to me, that is the most important finding, that going through the hard work of transforming many large, failed, dysfunctional high schools had nothing to do with the quality of the people. It had to do with the fact that the culture and the circumstance led to consistent failure. And that came about, and this is going to lead to the second point, in no small measure because whether we liked it or not, we had a tracked system in high school. And many of our most challenged students ended up in these particular large dysfunctional schools. It's never been about size. If you take many kids who are very high achieving and high performing and put them in a large school, that school will work all the time. But what we have learned in New York and throughout this country, if you do what we have done and others have done, put many very low performing students together in high school, uh, and a large high school that's impersonal, that doesn't connect students up to the adults, it's not gonna work. And that transformation was powerful and important. And the work of this report confirms the work of the Gates Foundation, which supported a large part of the work that we did in creating the new small schools. Now I want you to remember, in 2002 when we started, in the th eighth grade, fewer than 30% of our students were proficient in math and English language arts. Today, those numbers have doubled in English language arts and more than doubled in math. And that's why I say it's important when you think about the report to think about not just a high school strategy, but a K to 12 strategy. As long as 30% of your kids are proficient in the eighth grade, you're not gonna have the kind of graduation rates that people wanna see. I don't care what you do in high school. And I want people to understand that. As long as 30% are proficient, if you have not succeeded in the first K to eight years, no matter how much you can make up, and we've made up a lot, you will not succeed. So to me, the most encouraging sign is so many more kids tomorrow will enter high school more prepared than they were certainly in 2002, 2003. Now the report also suggests that somehow the successes of the small schools took a toll in other parts of the system, and I'd like to discuss in three ways that I think that the report in that respect is not accurate. Number one, while the graduation rate in the small schools went up, the graduation rate in the rest of the schools also went up. Indeed, over the course of the last five, six years, we have gone up in our graduation rate more than two points each year. And that's after a decade in which the city, using the same methodology, was flat. So from a decade of flat, in the last five, six years, more than two points each year. A small portion of that gain was driven by the new small schools. The rest was driven in the rest of the system. So it is clear that the new small schools did not reduce the graduation rate. If we had a rising graduation rate in the small schools and the rest of the system came down, then you'd say it was a wash. But the new small schools were part of a larger rising tide going to, I think, the significance of some of the other reforms, the empowerment and accountability reforms we've done. Second point, the, the report suggests that there were deflections, and I am sure there were some deflections of students who would have gone to the large schools into other schools, and that had an impact on attendance and graduation rates. But the report doesn't point out that there were some additional 15,000 students who came to high school during the years that were under investigation. And those students increasingly went to schools that had space. That's the nature of what happened. And that affected what happened at those schools. But the third, and in some ways, when you think about equity, to me, the most important point is think about what the, schools are, what the report is saying, is that certain schools that were attracting lots of high-performing students had to take more not-so-high-performing students. If you start out with 70% of your class that's below proficiency, and about 50% that could be at low level two and below, necessarily lots of schools are gonna have lots of students who are struggling. That's the definition of being below proficient as you enter high school. And so it is true that certain schools, that generally speaking, were doing better in the system. As they took more challenged students, their results weren't as great. That was limited to a relatively few schools, some of whom now passed the report, and I've checked the data as recently as last week, are moving forward again. But there's no question that if you measure the success of the school by the criteria, performance criteria on which it admits children, then we will say the great schools are those that screen kids for performance. 
To me, in New York City, the thing that we've changed in the discussion that's probably most important, great schools are schools that make progress, relatively speaking, that's greater compared to other schools with the same challenges. You cannot compare to a school that admits, based on gifted and talented, you cannot compare its performance to a school in a high poverty, high needs community with lots of English language learners and special education. But what you can do is compare two high need schools with each other and see what progress. That's why the story of Bushwick and the small schools is so powerful. Those are the same kids getting very different results. And so for me, the fact that certain schools as a matter of equity and choice, how to take more high need students reflects the fact, I think, that the system fundamentally was creating a rising tide and it makes sense to ensure that as you have children who are struggling, that they are equitably distributed in the system. And I think that's what we did and I think that's a good outcome even as we have to create a rising tide. And you'll hear from Steve Dutch some of the work he's done at Hillcrest a school that is a large high school, but that is incorporating many of the principles of the school, small schools movement, and you hear it's well from Eric Nadelstern. Third point, pivot point. The report also points out correctly that our challenges are gonna be greater because in the future, the state has eliminated local diplomas. That's gonna make it harder for students to graduate. I want you to know I supported that change and I continue to support that change. I think it's critical that we continue to raise standards until we reach the point that every child, not just in New York City, but throughout the country, is college ready when he or she graduates. We've reduced the number of children who need remediation, even as we've significantly increased the number of students who go to our city university. We've increased that number over the last seven years by 50% while the remediation rate came down. That said, we have got to get to the point where there's no remediation rate. That will require raising standards. So what does that mean going forward? Well, the first point is the point I started out with. If you have 70% or 80% of your students proficient when they get to high school, your success rate and their ability to get to a Regents Diploma will go, grow commensurately. And again, people who think only in high school terms are missing the story. If you lose the first eight or nine years, then you're always playing catch up. We have changed the first eight or nine years. Second thing, the work we are doing, inquiry teams, the work we are doing with respect to accountability, the use of ARIS, our achievement reporting platform, which teachers now tell me all the time, is helping them to move students forward, getting teachers working together to look at the challenges struggling students, continue to create more new small schools, small learning communities, so that we have the personalization. Those things will help us. Next thing that we're gonna focus on and, and is very important, and I saw Greg Bathiel and Mike Mulgrew talking before, both of them have been at the head of this thing to look very hard at career and technical. Indeed, one of the things I'm so excited about is CUNY, under the leadership of Chancellor Goldstein, is working with us to create a model of a nine to 14 school. It's always seen to me strange to have a nine to 12 and then a two year community. Nine to 14 focused on career and technical, I think we can get very different results. And similarly, I think if we look at the use of technology and try to tailor the instructional journey of a child to the child's needs, learning pace, and so forth, we will get better results. If you want to see a preview of some of the things we're thinking in that regard, visit the iSchool on the west side of Manhattan, which is doing some of the most cutting edge work in this city. Let me conclude by saying three things. First, again, Clara, to you and your team, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak today, but also thank you for the work you have done and the grist for the intellectual mill you've produced. Second, I have a little doubt that the work we're doing in small schools, in high school choice, and indeed in the K-8 space, all of which will continue to create this rising tide. I said to Clara, I'll say it here publicly, did everything we do work out exactly as planned? Of course not. Did we make mistakes? Of course. Are we constantly learning? Yes. And every day, I hope our work at the department gets better. Third, and finally, there will come a time in America, there will come a time in this city, and I hope this city leads America in that direction, where it doesn't matter what your parents did, doesn't matter what your skin color, or your family income, or your zip code. 
that every child, every single child, will get the education that enables that child to live his or her dreams. That won't happen if we don't do the tough and, yes, sometimes controversial work that school reform entails. Thank you for being here. Thank you for engaging in the discussion. Again, thank you for the report. Thank you, Chancellor Klein. Good morning. I'm Andrew White. I direct the Center for New York City Affairs here at Milano. Uh, the Center is an applied policy research institute that's dedicated to improving the effectiveness of government in its work with families and communities in New York. Um, and I just wanted to say a few things before we move to the next part of the program. Uh, for all of our ongoing projects, we convene an advisory board that includes practitioners, public official, former public officials, I should say, scholars, parents, and others. So that's true on our child welfare work and, and children and families work, and it's true on the public education work that we've been doing now for the past two years. These advisory boards play an important role, and they help us think through our projects when they're initially conceived, and they help to draft policy recommendations that we usually publish in the front of the book. Um, and they do that using the reporting we've done, the research we've done, and their own expertise, which they bring to the table. So I wanted to thank that group that was involved with this report. That said, they have no editorial role in the report at all, except around those policy recommendations. That's a, that matters because it's important that the sole responsibility for the reporting um, and the content of this project lies with its authors and with myself, the editor. So, um, you know, blame us, not them, um, or thank us. I also want to thank the leadership and staff of the Department of Education, which gave us lengthy interviews and shared valuable ideas and information about their work, including Chancellor Klein and Eric Nadelstern, who, who will be on the panel here today. And they candidly discussed with us what they do, what they could do differently, and gave us a lot of um, access to data and so on. So they deserve a lot of thanks for that. The same must be said for a number of principals and students, teachers, guidance counselors. We interviewed ridiculous numbers of them, but got remarkably great information. And I also want to thank the UFT for, for their um, input and ideas. Um, Lisa already spoke about the funders, so I add my thanks to them. Um, I got to say that this is a team project. Everything we do at the center is a team project. And the, the key authors, as you can see up there, are Clara and Kim. And in fact, it was Kim that drove this whole process from the beginning. So she, des she deserves credit. Um, Helen Zelon, Jessica Siegel, Helene Olin all worked on this, and a, cr a great crew of graduate students that include Tom Jacobs, Rajiv Yanani, Maybe Gonzalez, and others. So, um, if you like this work, it's, it's due to their sort of diligence and intensity on all of it. So the rest of this program, here's how it will proceed. I'm going to introduce Clara, and she'll give a short overview of the report. You've heard some of the findings through, through the Chancellor's filter. We'll give you the details of what we found. And then she's going to invite the panel up to the stage and moderate a discussion. You were all handed note cards when you came in. I hope you have them. Those are for your questions. And as the discussion goes on, please write down your questions. Please put your name and organization on there if you can, if you're willing to, and pass them to the people who will be coming around the aisles. Just hold it up and somebody will come around and collect it. Um, and then there will be time to have those discussions. We're not really going to have time for people to, in the audience to speak themselves, unfortunately. I'm very pleased to introduce Clara Hemphill, who for the last eight months or so has been senior editor at the Center for New York City Affairs. Many of you know her as the founder of InsideSchools.org and in a previous decade as the ace education reporter at Newsday. Clara. Thank you, Andrew. I want to invite the people who are standing in the back to come up in the, um, their seats in the front, I unless you want to stand. I don't know. Yeah. Um, um, I'm going to go quickly through. Um, I'm going to give you a short version of what's in the 72 pages on your lap. Um, Kim Nauer, um, I, I'm giving the words, but Kim Nauer did all the numbers and the pictures here. So uh, I really want to give her credit where credit is due. 
Um, if I could look at the first slide, please. This, this shows, um, if you see the dark numbers at the bottom, it shows how um, under the, during the Klein's years, the number of kids attending small schools, which we define as schools with enrollment of uh, less than 600 kids, really increased quite dramatically. Um, uh, it's up to about 85,000 now from about 29,000. But even as the small schools increased really dramatically, the large schools, which we define as uh, more than 1,400 kids, the large schools still take the majority of New York City kids. So that while a lot of the focus in the press and at the Department of Education has been on creating the small schools, we still have an enormous number of kids uh, in the large schools. And if you imagine this graph going out to the year 2050, you could see that even if we keep creating small schools at a very rapid rate, we're still going to have a lot of kids in the large schools. So that one of the things that we um, are saying in this report is that we have to pay attention to what goes on in the large schools. We can't just say that small schools is the solution because we still have so many kids in the large schools. Um, the chancellor did point out that the overall enrollment increased in his uh, first two years. You can see that. But it's been pretty stable for the last uh, four years or so. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, this shows us. Um, how many kids got diplomas in all the different sized schools? The big schools are the big dots and the small schools are the small dots and the medium sized ones are in between. The dark uh, dots show that more than 80% of the kids got uh, a high school diploma. Nowadays, um, in the, you could get a high school diploma by just getting a 55 on the Regents exams. But the children who started ninth grade this past year will now have to get 65. They'll have to get a more um, advanced, they'll have to get a, a more difficult to get diploma. And what we did, uh, if you give us the next slide, this is what happens if, uh, if the kids who graduate in 2007 had to have a Regents diploma, you'll see here that the graduation rates would have plummeted. So that our fear is that if nothing is done, the graduation rates will plummet in the next couple of years as the higher uh, standards go into effect. So that's the four-year challenge. That's what we have to figure out what to fix. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. This, is, um, this shows the gains of the small schools. If you look at the, um, the dark bar on the left, it shows what the graduation rate was at the big schools, what I call the biggie baddie schools, in 2002 before the small schools were created. Then if you look at the next bars, it shows what the graduation rates were in the new small schools that replaced them. Are these the same kids? Well, the answer is not exactly. Um, in the first two years, they did not accept special education kids or English language learners kids. Um, so it, it, it was a different population. In the very first years of the schools, there was a, um, uh, the more active parents probably chose the small schools. Um, Aaron Palis and his student Jennifer Jennings have done some research that showed in the very beginning the kids were, um, had somewhat higher attendance rates and somewhat higher um, rates of uh, uh, English, um, uh, English and math scores before they came in. But as the small schools proliferated, they began to take more and more challenging kids. And that now, on average, they take sort of similar kids to the schools as a whole. Um, I th it is true that they come from the same neighborhoods. It is school true that they don't screen for admission. Um, I don't really want to get into a debate about whether the small schools take um, needy kids or not. The truth is, in New York City, there's plenty of very needy kids to go around. Um, the small schools take kids with like a fifth and sixth grade reading level. Um, it's, uh, they're, they're taking some very tough kids. The first cohort, 75% of the kids in the small schools were reading below grade level. Um, so they're taking some very tough kids. However, I think it's true that these kids were not quite as needy as the schools that they replaced. 
but that they were more needy than the system as a whole. The other thing I want to say is that the gain, these gains are very fragile, that we have seen um, a, a, almost a majority of these schools have lower graduation rates in their second year than in their first. Most have declining attendance rates the longer they stay open, partly as a result of taking increasingly needy kids. Um, there's a very high turnover of teachers and a very high turnover of principals in these schools. Um, they burn very hot in the beginning and they burn very fast and there's, we have a fear that they're going to burn out. Can I look at the uh, next slide, please? Um, this is what happened to the, um, the remaining large schools in the three boroughs where most of the small schools were created. That is Bronx, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. Um, you see the first bar shows what the attendance and graduation rate was in 2002. The second bar shows what the attendance and graduation rate was in 2007. So as you can see, in these 14 schools in those three boroughs, uh, which represents about half of the big schools that remain in those boroughs, you saw that there is quite a decline in the attendance and graduation rates of those. You can also see on the bottom, it's, the print is kind of small, but you can look at it in your, um, in your report, that the, the, each of these schools had a rather large um, enrollment bump. Some of these schools have subsequently, the enrollment has gone down to where it was in the pre decline days. However, we found that the, um, the damage, as you will, continues after the graduation, uh, sorry, after the enrollment comes down. At a place like Norman Thomas, where they got, I think, 800 extra kids, um, this, that caused a huge amount of disruption in the school. And now, even as the enrollment is back to where it was, the disruption continues. Um, the chancellor said that um, overall the graduation rates have increased. Um, he's correct in that. However, the focus of this report is the at-risk kids. We were looking at the, the most vulnerable kids in the, in the uh, poorest neighborhoods. He's correct that schools like uh, Bayside High School in Queens had a steadily rising um, uh, uh, graduation rate, even as its enrollment increased. But what we're looking at here is the um, small schools in the, I'm sorry, the large schools in the neighborhoods uh, with the most at-risk kids. Can I look at the next slide, please? This is my favorite chart as, as, a, as the parent of an eighth grader. And how many eighth grade parents in the room? I like, yeah, okay, so you know what this is all about, right? This is how you apply for high school in New York City. Um, um, it, it, it's, the type's kind of small, you can look at it in your report, but um, it's complicated. It's always been complicated. Um, New York City has the lo largest system of, of uh, school choice in the country, probably the oldest system of school choice in the country. It's both a curse and a blessing, as those of us who've gone through it you know, can testify. Um, what the chancellor did was, um, he didn't invent this system. Um, and he actually made it better. Um, hard to believe if you only have an eighth grader, but those of us who have older children can tell you that it actually is better than it was. Um, what he did, though, was he eliminated zoned neighborhood schools in large swaths of the city. So there was no longer a default position. Now, as uh, Eric Nadelstern and others will tell us, that default was a pretty rotten default for a lot of kids. However, now, all eighth graders are required to navigate um, this system. And as the report shows, it's, it's kind of uneven. Um, what um, uh, parents who are um, uh, well-educated, who speak good English, tend to have a better chance navigating this complex system um, than new immigrants, than uh, uh, parents who are working two jobs and can't take off time to go to all the high school fairs and all of the tours. Um, so it's a very complex system, and it's particularly tough for the kids who don't have parents who, who can help them. And um, what I'll be asked, one of the questions I'll be asking the panelists is either how to simplify the system or how to make the default schools, that is the schools where kids end up if they don't have activist parents, how to make those schools acceptable. If I could have the next slide, please. These are um, you know, broad-based recommendations. Um, we, we had some students who had a recommendation of eliminate poverty. Uh, 
And I'm afraid these are almost as broad as that. Um, um, we think we, we need to come up with strategies to make um, the large schools more successful because the large schools are here to stay. Um, I'm, I think that some of the large school principals and teachers really tell us that they feel they've been dissed. You know, they feel that they've been treated with disrespect um, by the administration, that they're doing really hard work and they're not getting any credit for it. Um, so um, we have some strategies for um, uh, giving them more help. One of the things that the chancellor mentioned was that he got a, an executive principal at Washington Irving, which is one of the schools that got really clobbered by these reforms, that if you have very senior, strong leaders at these schools and that you give them the support they need, that they can begin to fix some of these uh, problems. Um, Stephen Dutch, who is on our panel, is at Hillcrest High School. He can talk to you about some of the ways, some of the strategies he's used to improve his school. Um, second, create some mid-sized schools. Um, one of the things that we found is that um, uh, mid-sized schools on average do as well with the at-risk kids as the, um, as the small schools do. Um, that might surprise you, but um, it's, a, it's a strategy which has been ov overlooked, I think, in the, in the past seven years. Um, one of the things that uh, we like about those mid-sized schools is that they're more likely to have, they're large enough to have resources like art, drama, music, sports, advanced placement, special education. These are things which the small schools really struggle to have. One of the things we like about the small schools is that they get some of the very needy kids over the bar to graduation. But one of the drawbacks is that with, 400, uh, with 20 teachers and 400 kids, you just don't have a very rich um, high school experience in these, other, uh, in these other areas. Give more support to special education and English language learners. One of the things that we found in the small schools is that uh, because they only have 20 teachers, they really, very few of them are able to specialize in helping English language learners or helping special education kids. Some of them do it well. Uh, we've highlighted some of the ones that do, and we think that, um, but we think a lot more needs to be done. And then number four, um, for those of you who have uh, children, um, don't assume that all 13-year-olds have good judgment. Um, 13 year olds shouldn't be left alone to navigate the complex Rube Goldberg device um, that, that, we decide, that, we, that we've described. Um, some of them um, do a good job, some of them do a bad job. Um, we have to have either more grown up supports for them or we have to figure out a way to make the system so that even the kids who don't have supports um, wind up in a decent place. So that's the end of my um, uh, uh, PowerPoint. I'm going to call up the panel now. Um, if you'll come up, please. Um, Zakia Ansari is a parent activist with the Coalition for Educational Justice. She has eight children. She tells me by the time you get to number eight, the high school admissions process is actually pretty easy. Um, her kids are at, um, she's got a, a ch child at a small school, child at a large school, child in a uh, mid-sized school. She has, um, um, one of her children went to Park West, which is what one of the big failing schools which uh, closed, although her child was valedictorian and was not a val failing student. She was also uh, had, has, has an experience of being, uh, having a child in one of the new small schools that replaced Park West. Uh, which is food and finance. We also have, oh, I thought you were going to sit alphabetically, but that's okay. You can just, you can figure out who they are when I speak to them. Uh, Stephen Dutch uh, is, was raised in Jamaica, uh, uh, Queens that is, not the island. Um, uh, New Hyde Park, he graduated from aviation high school, but he did not become an airline mechanic. Um, he uh, went to Queens College and taught elementary, middle, and high school before becoming the principal of Hillcrest High School in 1996. And he has one model for turning around the large schools rather than closing them, which is called small learning communities with fewer than 500 children each. He, he says that this approach isn't for the worst schools, but that it can save some of the marginal schools from, flipping, uh, from slipping down and becoming unsalvageable. We also have uh, Michael uh, Mulgrew, 
who's uh, vice president of career and te technical high schools for the United Federation of Teachers. He's also the UFT person who focuses on school safety. Mr. Mulgrew grew up in Staten Island and became a carpenter when he graduated from high school and he worked his way through the City University of New York. As a teacher of William E. Grady High School in Brooklyn, he took special pride in working with hard to reach kids and truants and teaching them filmmaking. His kids had a 75% graduation rate. We have Eric Nadelstern, who's the chief schools officer and a longtime uh, schools, small schools advocate. He went to DeWitt Clinton High School as a child and he taught at DeWitt. He founded the International High School and LaGuardia Community College campus in 1985, which has been really very successful with English language learners. Um, I am personally grateful to him for having uh, set up a lot of the small schools in the Bronx. My son attends one of them, which is the uh, High School of American Studies at Lehman College. I'm also personally grateful to him for pioneering the school-based option instead of seniority transfer, which gave principals the power to, um, with the cooperation of the union, to hire uh, teachers that they thought would work well with their school rather than having them signed, assigned by um, by seniority as it had been under the previous teacher's contract. Um, he also founded the Empowerment Zone, which was a, a small group of schools that had autonomy in exchange for accountability, and now the whole city has essentially become an empowerment zone. And then our other panelist is uh, Pedro Nogueira, who's a professor in the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development at New York University. He's also executive director of the Metropolitan Center for Urban Education. One of his areas of interest is high school is the high dropout rate among black and Hispanic males. Um, he's a public school parent with one child at a small school, which is the school of the future, and one at a mid-sized school, which is uh, Beacon High School. So, um, Andrew asked me to remind you that if, if you have questions, if you put them on cards um, and bring them to the uh, staff members who are uh, raising their hands right now. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, Eric Nadelstern the first question, which is that I, I think the new small schools are off to a really terrific start, but there are signs that they're going to have a tough time keeping up their initial success. Um, do you think it's a question of, of, of burnout for the staff, or, or do you have strategies for dealing with this? Well, as, <clears throat> thank you, Clara. Uh, as Joel indicated in his opening comments, um, the, uh, the initial success of the small schools uh, really represented uh, uh, one of our uh, most successful breakthrough strategies. Uh, we're talking about schools and buildings where the previous schools had graduated barely 30 percent, uh, having 80 percent of their kids graduate uh, in their first graduating class. Uh, there's nothing uh, that we could have done in a five-year period uh, that would have um, uh, resulted in, in those kinds of gains. Uh, it's true that in subsequent years, uh, the, uh, the remarkable gains of the first uh, graduating class uh, were not uh, sustained at the same high level. Um, however, uh, they decline, uh, they appear to be declining briefly and then leveling off at about a 70% graduation rate, which is still more than twice uh, the rate of uh, schools like Evander Childs and others where uh, there was just massive failure uh, in, in, those, uh, in those buildings prior to the new small schools. I have, my next question is for Zakia Ansari, which is, uh, what was it like for your child at Park West when the Department of Ed decided to close it? Your child stayed for another three years at a school that d the DOE called failing. W was that demoralizing? Um, it, I think it was demoralizing to a certain extent for the staff that was there. Um, I remember the day when they came in and they told us at a PTA meeting that they were going to close our, phase out our school. Um, and promised us that don't worry, we're going to ensure that all the children that are left in that school through the four years, the rest of the years that they're here are going to be taken care of and we're going to ensure that they get out of here and, you know, we're going to take care of that. So I left, you know, as a parent thinking, um, 
okay, we're, we're fine, you know, and I'm going to make sure that my children are doing okay. The parents that there were, were confident. Unfortunately, what happened in the last year, um, while again, it's as an involved parent, and many of the parents in the school were involved, to ensure that your children are getting the best, best education was the four, you know, up, up the, one of the first and most important things to do. But what happened towards the end is that there were a lot, it was a race to the end for guidance counselors to ensure that those kids that didn't have enough credits to graduate had a spot, had um, you know, one of those YABC programs and or just find another position or another space for those kids to be at. So to a certain extent, yes. Um, and it also being that it was a campus school created another level of um, you know, tension within the building as a whole as well, because it was a new thing coming in. You know, you had so kids. So the new schools were opening up as the old yes, school was there phasing was the, out. So you had four or five schools in the same building. Five or six, yeah, yeah in the same building. Um, and so I think that the teachers were great. They, they kept, you know, they ensured that those kids that were on point, they, they had everything possible. They ensured that they had, uh, you know, tutoring and everything they could to ensure that those kids were ready and prepared to graduate. Um, but it did create a little, uh, t some tension in the school, but I think the teachers and the staff did the best they could to ensure that the kids were, you know, uplifted and everybody's spirits were uplifted. Um, Michael Mulgrew, you're, you're the person of the teachers union who focuses on school safety. What's your impression of the safety record at the new small schools compared with the large schools they replace? Well, the uh, small schools, by and large, uh, because of the structure, would have, uh, have the ability to manage the students in a, in, a more, uh, in a more effective way. But the issue that we seem to be having with the small schools are the campuses. The, uh, the idea that four or five schools running independently inside of the same space have to cooperate in terms of campus-wide uh, safety procedures is not always done uh, the best way, effectively. And that is something we've been working on very uh, clearly, and I know that Eric has under his new role is uh, taking on the same challenge and he identifies that with us also. He sees that there is something we can do better because if you're sharing space together, there is problems if you're not cooperating with each other. Do you mean that the, the, the kids have stopped fighting with each other but the grown-ups are fighting with each other now? Uh, not always the case, but, <laughs> but uh, there's a, a myriad of, in, uh, there's a myriad of different uh, issues at the different campuses because it is, uh, it'd be a fascinating study to see the different unique personalities of the different campuses. But it is a challenge that we have to address because that is problematic at this point. But, but I mean, you agree that the old big schools were kind of scary, right? Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. And, and the new ones are, the new small schools are not scary. Uh, no. Or less not, scary. They're less scary. Less scary. But okay. there are still always challenges. We are always looking to do, in safety, it's always looking to do things better. It can never be enough as far as we're concerned with safety. Um, Pedro Nogueira, as, as, a, as a parent, and also somebody who works with uh, at-risk kids, do you have suggestions for um, streamlining the high school admissions process or making it fairer or easier to access? Well, I, I think at the minimum, they've got to um, invest more in, in counselors um, at the, the middle school level because uh, you basically have kids making these decisions on their own in many cases because the parents are overwhelmed uh, by the amount of information they have to sort through. And you can't even rely on the information that's available because there's a lot of uh, false information uh, about the schools, and, which is understandable. Schools are trying to put their best foot forward uh, and represent themselves as well as possible. but that gives a false impression sometimes of what is really going on at the school. And you have many cases where kids think they're choosing a school for a particular theme and discover that theme is not even operative at all. Uh, and so you really need someone uh, to help students. But the, the simple fact is this. A choice system only works if there's lots of good choices. And unfortunately, there are limited good choices in New York City right now. Uh, the fair side of this is there are more good schools now in New York probably than ever before. However, there are still several schools that are not acceptable, and large numbers of kids end up there and end up uh, not well served. Um, Stephen Dutch, that sort of leads into the question I had for you, is that you, have a, um, you run a large, comprehensive high school, which has been a neighborhood school, a default school for a lot of uh, at-risk kids, but it also has some um, strong students as well. Um, the, you divided your school into small learning communities. 
This is an idea that's been tried a lot of places, and a lot of places it's flopped. Um, what makes Hillcrest different? I think what makes Hillcrest different in this matter is the fact that we had the ability to work collaboratively with New Visions for Public Schools, and we made a major investment in building the adult capacity within the building. So not only did we change the structure within the building, we also increased the level of support and the level of adult learning of both the assistant principals, myself, and the teachers within the school, so that in transforming the school from one large school of 3,200 to uh, a school that has seven four-year small learning communities of 450 or, or less students and two one-year immersion programs for uh, struggling incoming ninth graders and students who are new to the country, we've been able to better understand how we have to change the craft of instruction. So not only did we change the physical structure of what the school looked like, we made a major investment to improve the adult ability to service the students that we have within the school. Um, Eric, I have a question for you about how teaching is different now from when you were a principal at International. Your, your school, for example, required portfolios of students' work rather than the Regents' exams. Um, do you miss that? Do I miss being a principal? <laughs> Every day. <laughs> One of the best jobs I've ever had. <laughs> I like that answer. I'll have another question. Are there lessons from the small schools that can be transferred to the large schools? Yeah, and that, and that is an important question, Clara, because as you rightly point out, um, small schools are part of a larger solution, uh, but can't be the entire solution. Uh, there, there are three things about small schools that I, I think um, make them particularly successful with kids across a wide range of ability levels. Uh, the first is the personalization possible uh, when it becomes possible to learn the names of all of the kids in a school by November. Um, uh, when you talk to kids who've dropped out of uh, high school, uh, one of the things they mention most frequently is uh, uh, that no one in the school knew who they were or even realized they were gone. Uh, the, second, uh, the second characteristic of uh, successful small schools that I think all schools uh, could begin to uh, focus on is relevance. That is, what kids learn today uh, has to be presented in a way that's immediately relevant in their lives, as opposed to the kind of thing that, that many of us experienced when we were students. Uh, and uh, we would ask, why are we learning this? And we were told, well, you're learning it for, for some distant point in the future when uh, you may need it in college, you may need it in careers. Uh, creating uh, the opportunity for kids to discover the, re the immediate relevance of what they're learning and the way in which what they're learning can immediately be applied to improve their lives and the lives of people in their communities is something good small schools do well and that all schools need to do better. And finally, uh, making connections for kids. Uh, connections between subjects, uh, what they learn in science is connected to what they learn in mathematics, what they learn in social studies uh, can be connected to what they learn in, uh, in English and the literature they're reading. Connecting what they learn in school to their lives and communities beyond school um, and creating a school at the center of a network of services, not just for kids, but for kids and their families. I think those are the most important lessons. Um, Michael Mulgrew, do you have ideas of how to make the large schools safe besides putting in metal detectors? Look, safety is like anything else in a school. Uh, it has to be worked on by the entire school community. It's all about culture and the community of the school. We have very large schools that are extremely safe. We have very large schools that have problems, just as we have small schools that have problems. It all comes down to culture and community. If you set the correct tone and the expectations are there, schools work. We can write all the regulations we want. Unless you choose 
as a school community to work this situation and set the correct tone. It's just like education was like what Eric was just speaking about. How do you teach students now? Students are much different. Uh, you know, when, when I was growing up at the age of three, I don't think I was manipulating a Wii game. And uh, these are things that really have made a difference in what children now, how they learn. And this means that we have to engage students. You have to engage them in every part of the school. You have to engage them in the classroom. You have to engage them in safety. So in order to do that, it means that the school itself has to work in a very strong collaborative way. It cannot be top down. It has to work together. And you can make these changes because a lot of schools now are making these shifts, but it requires a lot of work and support. And if you can do that, then you see successful schools. Where we don't see this happening, that's where we have problems. Uh, Zeka Year Ansari, when um, your child attended um, Park West, which was a big school, although she had a good experience, a lot of kids did not, and it was um, known as a fairly disorderly school. And then another child attended Food and Finance, which was one of the smaller schools that was created in Park West. This is on the west side of Manhattan. Was food and finance a better situation? Was it a, 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 of course, children are different, so one child's experience can be very different from the others. But would you say overall that food and finance was, a, was an improvement over the school that it replaced? Um, I don't know if I would say that. I, I mean, I know schools are labeled a certain way, but when you're a parent in that school and you're involved in that school, like you see it, you don't, you don't always see all that stuff that goes along with what's put in media and what's put in numbers. So to, to be quite fair and quite honest, I think, um, you know, food and finance was smaller structure. Again, it's about, for me, it was about knowing my child. And I knew that that small school was what she needed. Um, and that culinary arts was what she wanted to do. And it offered that, which is something, as Michael talked about, engaging and changing, that the school day needs to change as well in regards to ensuring that kids are doing what they need to do. So food and finance didn't have, um, they had um, sports teams, you know, and they had a whole host of different things that, um, allow children to be able to be involved and parents to be engaged. Um, and, but so did Park West. They had a sports team as well. It was just like two different entities. One was larger, one was smaller. Um, I don't know if one was any better than the other at the time. Again, I know what the numbers say and I know what people say, but as my personal experience was that it was a great group of staff, um, great group of students, um, and that they did the best they could to, with the children they had. Uh, Pedro Nogueira, we, at one of the forums we had here before, we had uh, Myron Orfield uh, talk about how low-performing kids do better in schools that are racially and economically integrated than they do in segregated schools. And I just wonder what, um, what you think that the Department of Ed could do. Do you think racial integration is important, and what can the Department <coughs> of education do to encourage racial integration in the high schools? Well, I think it's uh, essential, and I, I think it's one of the big issues that um, not being addressed at all in New York City right now. Uh, I often think it's ironic because I, the chancellor speaks very passionately about education as a civil rights issue, but the civil rights issue that we've most known in education, which is racial integration, doesn't get talked about at all. It's as though we've come to accept the fact that we will remain, re retain racially separate schools that are not only separate on the basis of race, but also on the basis of class. Uh, right now in New York City, because of the economy, we have a better chance now to produce integrated schools than ever before, because many middle class parents can't afford private schools anymore. However, private uh, middle class parents will do whatever they can, and I'm one of them, to get their kids into good schools, even if it means they will step over others. They'll, they'll take anything. So that requires, <laughs> <laughs> that requires the DOE to exert some influence over school admissions policies and to actively promote diversity and to say there's got to be some equity in admissions. And I don't see this being addressed at all at the, at the central level. And I think this is not something you can leave for principals to resolve on their own. Uh, and there are some controversies brewing. And it's ironic, because some of the schools we have the controversies right now, such as Beacon, where my son attends, is more diverse than many others. But they're raising an issue that's pertinent to the entire city, which is the fact that poor kids are being left out of the better schools in the city. 
Yeah, I'm actually encouraged by what's going on at Brandeis. I think that there's, you know, there's some possib real possibilities for racial integration there. As you may know, Brandeis is on West 84th Street, um, and it um, has long served kids from all over the city, but not kids in the neighborhood. Um, and it has, you know, despite quite a good principal, it has not had um, a good success rate, and the DOE had decided to close it, start phasing it out this year. And there's um, a lot, but I'm optimistic that the new schools that are going to replace it. Um, yeah, go ahead, Peter. But you know, my daughter goes to School of the Future, which is far more diverse. Yeah. And that doesn't just happen. It happens because of a clear commitment on the part of the leadership to make it happen. Tell and, us how that works. Well, I, I don't know exactly how they pull it <laughs> off, but because <laughs> they also do interviews, but they have clearly made a commitment to being as representative as possible, not only with respect to racial diversity, but with respect to kids who don't speak English, kids with special needs. So they, they're making sure that their schools are representative. That, it can't just be left to the principal, is my point. DOE needs to step in and say, look, we need to make sure that kids from the Bronx and the, and, and the East New York are not being left out of our better schools. Uh, I think it's, so, it's such a, a, a shame. If you look at the uh, so-called exam schools in this city right now, uh, they uh, almost entirely exclude poor kids of color from uh, high poverty areas. And that was never the case before. That was never the case in this, well, it wasn't until recently. I was at an event, <laughs> I'll say this briefly, for Hunter College, they, uh, Hunter High School, they did an event celebrating the uh, accomplishments of the uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, who is the uh, one who directed In the Heights, who's one of their graduates. Mm -hmm. And I pointed out to them, there are very few kids from Washington Heights who ever got to go to Hunter anymore. Mm -hmm. right? And it's not because there aren't talented kids there. It's because we haven't found a way to make sure those, kids, those schools are accessible. This is a civil rights issue that the DOE is not addressing. Uh, Eric, Eric would like to respond, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> here's, here's how I think about it and how, how I'd like to uh, encourage you to think about it. Um, for most of my career, um, a generation, the Board of Education warehoused the hardest to educate kids who were largely uh, poor kids of color, special ed kids, uh, English language learners in 35 or 40 academic comprehensive high schools. Uh, starting uh, seven years ago, we began closing down those schools because uh, uh, they had developed such a culture of failure that there was nothing we could have done. Uh, to keep those schools intact and change the outcome uh, for the tens of thousands of kids who attended those 40 schools. Those kids then dispersed through the high school system because they were given greater opportunity to attend more and better schools than ever before. Pedro talks about um, the need to further integrate schools and I couldn't agree with him more. It's, it's key to the uh, uh, success of uh, not just the school system, but, but of the entire city and, and the society we live in. However, the act of, sim simply the act of closing those large failed schools made schools more integrated uh, than they've ever been in, uh, certainly uh, during my uh, 38 years uh, working in the New York City public schools, but um, like most of you, I go back even longer than that to when I was a student in the New York City public schools. Um, today, as a result of the closure of large failed schools, our schools have never been more integrated before. Now, with that integration uh, came challenges because uh, a lot of high schools began receiving students who were underprepared uh, in, in uh, numbers that they had never seen before and then how to begin developing programs and strategies to more effectively uh, respond to the needs of those kids. And uh, in a number of cases, Steve's is uh, uh, simply one of the leading uh, cases at Hillcrest, but there are many others like that. We're doing a better job uh, in more integrated schools with a wider population of students than, than uh, has ever been the case in the New York City public schools. However, that still leaves four out of 10 kids who are not graduating from high school, uh, and we need to figure out ways to address the needs of those kids as well. I wanna ask the people who have the cards to bring them up to me now. Um, um, I wanna point out a couple of schools that are um, 
racially integrated and how they do it. Um, one of them's Midwood High School, which Helen's uh, children went to, two of Helen's daughters went to, uh, which has, it's in Midwood in Brooklyn. It has, it's a mostly African-American neighborhood, um, well, also Orthodox Jew, but um, the kids that go to the school are mostly African-American. But they have a, a, a gifted program that attracts kids of all races, two gifted programs that attract kids of all races from all over Brooklyn. Um, and it doesn't feel like a school of have and have not. Some of the schools uh, that have that kind of situation feel segregated within the school, but in fact, the kids in the honors program attend the same biology class as the kids um, in the neighborhood program. Um, they go to the same band, they go to the same um, music classes and the same art classes. Um, and the, the kids in the honors program do eventually take more advanced classes than the kids in the regular program, um, although the kids in the neighborhood program can move back and forth. So that's one example of a way to integrate a school. Um, another is Murrow High School in, in Brooklyn, which has the educational option formula, which means that uh, half the kids are assigned by computer in a way in which 16% um, have low reading and math scores coming in, 16% have high reading and math scores coming in, and uh, the rest are, are, are average. So these are a couple of ways in which the city has been um, successful in um, uh, uh, integrating at least a few schools. Um, if you're talking about racial integration, um, about 12% of the high school students are white, and I think about 10% are Asian. So, you know, there are not a lot of white kids to go around. Um, in terms of economic integration, about, I think, 75 or 80% of the high school kids are qualify for free lunch. So there's not a lot of uh, middle class kids um, to go around either. I have a couple of questions um, from the audience, um, which I'll uh, throw out. Um, should I tell you who, who gave the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, Emily Sosa. Emmeline Sosa, college intern at the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. Uh, for Pedro Nogueira, how will small schools benefit la black and Latino male students? Please share your opinions about the criminalization of our male youth in urban schools. Does, these are three questions. I, I'll ask them all. You can pick which one you want to answer. Um, uh, uh, does safety justify the prison culture in urban schools? <laughs> so I, I think um, the data shows, and, and again, that many of these small schools are a real improvement over uh, the larger schools. And I, I think this is, again, something that DOE deserves credit for, because producing these schools was one way in which we changed the, the graduation rates in the city. At the same time, we've been tracking uh, what's happening with black and Latino males because that represents one of the more vulnerable groups throughout the city. And what we're seeing are that for this population, not that much change. Now, that's partially because they're overrepresented in the failing schools still. Uh, and, and so, it, it, again, it speaks to the fact that you need a more targeted strategy. And this was what concerns me. There are two strategies that DOEs use that I think are not well thought through. One is the whole idea of autonomy. Autonomy works where you have good principles. Right? We have good resourceful principles. They're able to take advantage of being autonomous and do incredible things. And I see lots of examples of it. Where you have inexperienced principals with lots of high need kids and a lack of resources, you end up with not a very good situation. And those schools need far more support than they're getting now. And sometimes they don't even know what kind of help they need because they're overwhelmed, okay? And so to say it's on them to fix themselves is not a strategy for improvement. The second problem is now we're gonna say we're gonna just raise the standards. I'm all for raising the standards. I think the chance is right. We're not gonna get more kids going to college, prepared for college, if we don't raise the standard. But raising the standards is the easy part. The hard part is then, okay, what's the work that needs to go on to get right. these kids ready to meet those standards? And I, again, don't hear a strategy being rolled out for how to do that. Now, I, if we had more time, I could talk about what would work. And we actually have schools in the city that are showing us it could work. Multicultural High School in Queens serves very large percentage of ELL students, graduates the vast majority of them. We have models of success in the city that we're not learning sufficiently from. And to connect it to the question of security, 
Metal detectors are sometimes necessary, and you can ask the kids, they will tell you, we sometimes, we're not safe here, right? And we need security. At the same time, you can go to schools in the city, some have metal detectors on the same neighborhood, some don't. Why? Because the schools that have created a sense of community that Michael talked about, the schools where kids are known, don't need guards and metal detectors for security. So we need to, to, to do a better job at learning from what's working already in the city. We have lots of examples of successful schools, but sometimes no one, and particularly the principals, really understand why are they succeeding while we're still floundering. And we need to do a better job at that. Does that answer, does safety justify the prison culture in urban schools? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no, and, and I always try to remind people, prisons are not safe places either, right? And, um, <laughs> so that should not be our model for safety. Um, what, what we should be striving to do is to, to really work closer with community organizations to help address some of the, the facts. Gangs are a real issue. When you bring kids from many different communities together, you increase the, the likelihood of gang violence and, and conflict within schools. If you work with community agencies that understand what's going on, schools are in a better position to respond more creatively to some of those challenges they face. Uh, but simply bringing in lots of, uh, the ironic thing is that you, uh, I, I go to one school, I won't name it, uh, They've got guards all over the place, eating donuts, uh, you know, blocking up the hallway. I said, I asked the kids, does this make you safe? They said, yeah, on the first floor, when you go upstairs, it's not too safe. There's only security on the, on the front entrance. And they're ignoring what's actually happening in the building. So, and it's not to say we want police in classrooms, you know, doing the work of, 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 of teachers. But it is to say that the strategy is too limited and, and doesn't really get at the core issue which is kids who are not connected to learning. Kids who, who've given up are kids who are gonna pose a, a, a risk to others. And that's the issue. How do you get these kids reconnected to learning so that school matters for them, so that they have a reason to behave themselves in school? Um, thank you. Um, here's a question. Um, Kim, Kim Landsman, incoming member of CCHS. Uh, nobody's talked about money. Isn't the lack of it a major part of the problem and getting more of it a major part of the solution? Anybody? I'll take it. The UFT, please. Yes. <laughs> Look. Who wrote that? It's an, uh, Kim Landsman, CCA. Kim, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, look, we are now facing a $400 million cut to the school system for, the, for next year. We have not had a cut to this school system anywhere like this in a very, very long time, and especially not in the last seven years, because we have been funded. And when you fund the schools, you see the difference. That has a direct correlation to the gains we have made. So this is a very critical issue. And sad to say, all of the experts are telling us that this $400 million cut we're looking at for the incoming year is better than the outlying year. So how are we going to do this? Pedro was absolutely right. A lot of schools need support. We need to figure out a way to be more effective in figuring out what's working over here and help the principal over here understand how to do it. We cannot just leave them to their own devices. We need to be smarter and much more efficient facing these drastic budget shortfalls. Because if not, we will, as a school system, probably start going backwards, which nobody wants. So we have to figure out ways to be creative inside of the school system and be more efficient. And that will require a different support network. Not here, you're on your own, here's your SSO, LSO, PSO. And, uh, they'll, and it's up to you to figure out what's working and not working for you. There is a lot of information out there, a lot of schools have figured out, and we need to figure out how to get that together in a place that can help the schools more effectively. And the different programs that we run, uh, Stephen here runs small learning communities. Small learning communities have proven to be effective when done correctly. But one of the things that makes small learning communities uh, a problem at a school is they do cost more. They cost more to run small learning communities. So how can he continue to do this, the work that he has done so successfully, when now his school is getting a cut on top of the fact that he was already expending his budget to run those communities? So it's going to be difficult for schools like his and other schools. So this is a real issue 
That has to be up front at all times right now. Eric, do you want to add your thoughts? Yeah. Um, you know, it's not as if we didn't try dictating to schools how they should educate 1.1 million kids for decades with, uh, with very little success. Um, the, the autonomy issue is misunderstood to the following extent. Um, the people in the schools, principals, teachers, and others in that school community, need the opportunity to figure out um, how their kids can be most successful and to own the solutions that they come up with. Good schools have done that for decades, ignoring the rules and regulations that emanated from central offices and, and district offices. And sometimes the, the schools furthest from the standard are the ones that need the greatest amount of autonomy. I doubt that a guy like uh, Steve Dutch would have had the opportunity to completely uh, transform a, a, a school like Hillcrest that was teetering on the brink in a situation where the important decisions about who worked at that school and how the resources were spent, how the day was scheduled, um, and how the school was, was organized were made by people who had never met his kids, who never had to confront the families in that school, who were unfamiliar with the community or the, the particular needs of that building. The advantage to empowering the people who work in schools, and good schools have always felt that empowerment, is that if we're going to be successful with 100% of our kids, principals and teachers need to work harder and longer and smarter than they've ever worked before. And they're not likely to do that if we try to mandate them to do that or to contractually obligate them to do that. They do that because they own their own professional effort. Now, it's, it's totally uh, uh, uninformed to suggest that that degree of empowerment doesn't, is, is antithetical to support. Our school support teams, the network leaders and their teams, are in those buildings on a weekly basis, working side by side with principals and teachers, not dictating to them how they could do it better, but working side by side with them, coming up with common solutions that make sense for, for that school community and that can be generalized across all of the schools in, in a particular network. Clara, can I respond? That leads, uh, yes, can go I ahead. Yeah. Oh, um, so, uh, you know, I'm hearing back and forth. Um, and I, I think the key is often when you engage, it's great to engage parent, um, teachers and principals, but the parents have to be totally engaged by mm -hmm. the principal, by the teachers, by the, the high expectations in the school. We want to be involved in helping push that school forward, no matter how that school looks like. Um, one of the things that I noticed in the report, it says that you know half of New York City ninth graders are reading below school level. That means they're coming from middle school, not prepared for high school. So as CEJ, what we've been doing over the last two years, really pushing the crisis that's going on in middle schools. Not only pushing what needs to be done and, coming, and that coming out of DOE, working collaboratively with them, um, as well as all the other stakeholders, to really say there needs to be something going on, something really concrete in middle schools, so that we, we really lessen the issue that's going on in high school. Because if you have half of the kids coming in reading, obviously there's a disconnect in middle school. So it's really clear that that needs to happen. Um, <laughs> And the only way that's going to happen is if we work together um, to ensure that, you know, there needs to be funding, obviously. But for parents, you don't have money, that doesn't mean that you stop educating my child. That's real. You, if the money's not there, it's time to figure out a creative way to make something happen in that school. So while we agree that money needs to be there, if it's not there, then let's figure out another creative way to get our kids through middle school so that in high school they're not having these issues and they're not having these problems. Right. Um, I, I want to hear more from um, Stephen Dutch about what you think the city should be doing to make the large schools more successful across the city. I think one thing is uh, recognizing the fact, and I, I think it's a good start here today, realizing that the great preponderance of kids will remain in large schools and that even if the small school movement continues, there still will be a great number of kids attending large schools. And, and the idea is to how to share the successes of what's happening in the small schools and transforming that into what's happening in, in, in a larger school. In, in our own particular instance, we had the opportunity to visit several small schools throughout the city before we embarked on our transformation. 
And one of the things that we really saw that was successful there was the fact that they really created a very personalized environment in which students knew their teachers and they had a meaningful adult that they could have uh, interaction, positive interactions with. And as friendly as we thought Hillcrest was, we realized that with nearly 200 teachers and over 3,000 students, there were kids that were going to fall through the cracks. So, so one of the things they, um, you think would be useful is if other big school principals could visit small schools. It, through the lens of realizing that you're not going to visit the small school because you're right. a bad principal are there, and are there you're other a bad things school. that the DOE could do to encourage the uh, large schools to adopt some of the things that you've done? Well, is, there, is, it, is it just up for each up to each principal for, to decide for himself how to do it, or do you think there's something the DOE can do um, centrally to help this happen? At this point, to the best of my knowledge, it is up to the principal to make the decision as to whether they want to embark on this, this type of journey. And this type of journey, as Eric mentions, does require a lot of work on the behalf of the, of the entire school community in being able to transform itself from being a large school to being uh, seven semi-autonomous schools within the building. Just think about the logistics of moving uh, personnel, moving space, moving uh, sharing space, and creating all, all, all of those strategies. Uh, what I think has happened, and even talking to my uh, colleagues who still are principals of large schools, is they don't really realize the benefits. And they don't really realize what the outcomes of it can be. And uh, they, they're afraid to embark on the journey. They, there's not enough research out there for the staff to embrace it readily. They're, they're afraid of the change. There is that fear that if they're saying that they're going to move into small learning communities, there must be something wrong with their school. So now someone is going to be looking at that school to see if that should be the next large high school that is closed down. So I think in some ways people resist it because of, of fear of saying that there needs to be a change within their organizational structure. And possibly if principals from large schools saw the outcomes in, in, in places like Hillcrest or what we consider our sister school, New Dorp on Staten Island, that, that's done a similar type of transformation, they would be able to see the benefits not only to the students but to the community as a whole and certainly that you're creating an environment in which teachers can teach better because they get to know their students better and they have more say in how the school and the small learning communities are structured. Thank you. Pedro. I, I just want to follow up on Steve's point because I think this is exactly what I think is needed. It's a midpoint between See, I agree with the idea of autonomy. I agree with the idea that you don't want the DOE coming from down on mandating to principals. At the same time, right now, there are some networks that provide real good support to their schools. The urban assemblies, I think, are doing a great job. The international high schools are doing a great job. There are other schools where the principal is, treats the support organization as their, um, they're the, 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 the support organization is the client, not the client, the, the school is the client. And they get to decide whether or not, what they want. And so the support organization might need to tell them, look, you're screwing up your school, you know, and you're, you're doing some bad things, but they're afraid that if they give that kind of critical feedback, they'll lose that contract, right? So in, in, in their ability to, to actually provide the kind of help that's needed is limited. I think what, what, what Steve's talking about, it makes a lot of sense. You create, if the DOE could establish a few professional development schools throughout the city, model schools, they could say, look, if you want to see the best reading program for high school students, go to Hillcrest. You want to go see the best uh, program for ELL students, go here. And set these up so that principals and teachers can actually go and see and learn from success as it's taking place, instead of trying to figure it out on their own. Right now, principals who are not well informed are making decisions about what reading program they should purchase, and they're just picking this out of that, but based on what's come to them, and they're not prepared to make good decisions in too many cases. Um. Um, I, have a, I have a question from a teacher, Martina Hooker, at John Dewey High School in Brooklyn, which is uh, one of the uh, schools that was on our chart of, of big schools that were having trouble. Um, in September 08, we had a very large number of incoming freshmen who'd missed anywhere from 30 
to 80 days of school during eighth grade. Does anyone on the panel have a suggestion or information about what should be done to address this crisis situation of poor attendance that many of our schools are faced with? Uh, you let's go start with, you go first. Let's start with Dutch, because he actually has to do this as a principal. It is what it is. You, you, you do get the students that you're going to get. And uh, in, in the change in the last few years, with, with small school choice being there and, and with students having 12 opportunities to pick, 12 choices of picking a high school, there is much more choice that a family can make. So it is, it is the responsibility of the school to really begin to look at how they're recruiting students into the school to make sure that they continue to get a mix of students, both uh, ethnically and, and, uh, and as far as their economic needs go. But in some cases, you're going to be getting in struggling kids. And some school in New York City is going to be getting them. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, we're talking about one school in particular, but we, we've had that happen at, at Hillcrest as well. The school community really needs to begin to realize that this is a new population that's coming into the school, and that the school needs to regroup itself as to how they can best service this population. But, but do you, do you, you do can you, make all the calls you want and whine to people saying, I shouldn't be getting all of these deflections, but the school community then begins to need to look to see what services they're providing kids that will give them a chance of being successful. Kids who have 70% attendance when they're in middle school do present a unique challenge for the school community when they're coming into high school. The school community, the principal, the teachers, the assistant principals, the guidance counselors, <laughs> need to realize that and realize that they need to revisit the practices that have been successful in the past in their school and come up with new strategies to support that struggling population. Be it meeting with the families, be it increasing the services for outreach for attendance, be it restructuring what uh, ninth grade programs look like. The fact is some school is going to be getting these kids. And the school has to prepare itself to be able to support these kids the best it possibly can. And but does in that involve calling the parents? Does that, I mean, Harold Levy had an op-ed in the Times saying that you should, you know, use high pressure sales tactics to get the kids in. Uh, there are, it, it, unfortunately in our city, there are kids as young as 13 years old that are basically living on their own. That's right. Their parents may not be in the country. Their parents may be working two jobs. They may live, be living with a relative. They may have a totally dysfunctional life outside of school. It's the school's responsibility then to come up with ways to try to make school engaging. I would say the system has done a fairly good job in creating small schools and creating small learning communities that kids don't feel anonymous and isolated that they can come into a school environment and be able to share situations that are happening at home uh, and, and that the school can provide a safety network for that child to be successful in school. Will we meet with success with every child? No. Probably not. But as Chancellor Klein mentioned before, that's why a lot of the work has to be done in K through eight, yeah. so that when kids are coming into high school, they're better prepared. But the reality is, is there are going to be kids who are not successful, who will be coming into the school, and the principal and the entire school community has to look to see what they can do to best support this child. And in many cases, especially in large schools, are going to have to change what had been past practices. Michael Mulgrew, one of the things you did was um, you gave filmmaking classes, which was something that engaged kids. And I think you, you're a proponent of vocational education, a place like Transit Tech, where mm -hmm. kids learn how to fix uh, subway cars, um, is, is a school that um, is successful engaging kids who've had um, uh, poor attendance in the past. Am I right? Career and technical education has proven to be very successful, especially uh, 
across all students, across all, it, all performance levels of students, it's been proven to be very successful over the past since it's been transformed from vocational to career in tech ed. John Dewey's an interesting case because it really speaks to your report because you have a large school, failing school, within eyesight of that school that, was just, that is in the process of phasing out, mm -hmm. which was Lafayette High School. So the question here is that this school was going, is now dealing with the issue of getting a large population from the neighborhood that was pro previously probably going to go to Lafayette High School. Now it is absolutely true that all students have to be educated. End of story. There is no excuse for that to, for anyone. We, we would accept on that. But now the school has a distinct population that perhaps we could have had a system in place knowing that this phasing in, phasing out was happening in its neighborhood, we could have had something put in place. The school, if it's it, attendance issues, my recommendation would be to find a successful CBO working in that side of Brooklyn that has been, and there are quite a few of them, in dealing with schools that have had attendance problems in the past and engage them for your school. But this is a question of, as we're doing this type of changes, when we're closing out a large school, what supports do you give to the large schools that all of a sudden are getting populations that they're not used to serving? Yes, it is their responsibility to serve them, but what can we do to help them as this transformation takes place is hey, the question. I, I have to say this because I had a student this semester uh, did a study on truancy. Uh, trying to understand, because I think that there's an assumption there that there are lazy kids at home watching TV no. who don't want to go to school. And I think Steve's brought, brought out a number of issues. When he starts doing the research, he starts to find out kids are staying home because they're taking care of sick parents, because they're watching siblings, because their lives are kind of out of control, can't afford the, the subway fare, all right? And for some reason, could, they couldn't get their subway card. Uh, and, and once he starts to realize, he says, wow, we need a different strategy to address the truancy problem. It's not just about pressure to get these kids. I've been saying for a while, why hasn't mayoral control led to a comprehensive plan to connect schools to social services that are either controlled by the city or by nonprofits in the community? What's happening right now is we leave it to the principal. Where you have savvy principals, they build the partnerships and they've got services for their kids and they're doing it and they're showing us it can be done. You can't just leave it to the principal. The principals are overwhelmed. That's where the central office, okay, we can talk so much about accountability. This is something they should be accountable for, okay? They should be accountable for providing this support to schools. You can't just put it all on the back of a principal. It's too much. Eric, that's your cue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling. You know, um, We've done, we've done some of the things that uh, Pedro just talked about. We've worked with uh, DYCD to open beacon programs and out-of-school time programs uh, and uh, create the kind of uh, uh, after-school weekend and summer supports that uh, kids and families require in order to succeed. Uh, that's not to say that we don't need to do more, but we should also acknowledge uh, that under the administration uh, there has been uh, this degree of articulation between agencies in a way that has increased uh, the opportunities available to kids. Um, a quick comment on the previous question. Uh, Pedro's right in terms of some of the underlying conditions that prevent some kids from attending school, but more often than not, um, attendance is an instructional question. Uh, and it's not simply about making class more engaging. It's about creating the opportunity for uh, a broad uh, segment of the population, regardless of uh, what their skills level and academic capacity is, uh, to be successful. And there is nothing that succeeds in school like success. And when you create opportunities for uh, kids, even those who are struggling uh, at uh, uh, teenage years to master basic literacy and numeracy skills, uh, to be successful and to see their way toward success, uh, it is much less likely that they will stop coming to school, that they'll have sporadic attendance, that they'll drop out. Um, the plain uh, fact of the matter is that large schools like Hillcrest 
have to break into smaller uh, learning communities in order to provide kids with that kind of experience and that kind of support when they fall through the cracks. Large schools work well for kids who uh, are on track uh, to graduate. And, and uh, we've heard uh, an example here where uh, even in its final days, it was possible for a segment of kids at Park West High School to, uh, to get a good education. Now, that that might have been true for 15% of the entire population uh, is, is the reality of, of those schools in those circumstances. And where kids fall through the cracks in those large schools, there simply aren't the safety nets to uh, identify why not because of the very structure of the school and the way it's set up in ways that don't create direct lines of, not just personalization, but direct lines of responsibility and accountability for the success of each and every kid. That is a scale issue. When there are thousands of kids packed into a building uh, and the building is under-resourced and organized along department lines and teachers have uh, 170, 180 kids that they're dealing with on a daily basis, you can't, no matter how many counselors you, you pile into that building, create the kinds of safety nets necessary uh, to address the four out of 10 kids who aren't graduating from school. I have a, a philosophical question. Um, is there a contradiction between choice and equity? Yes. No one? All right. I, I'll answer um, yeah. yes. yes. <laughs> um, next question. <laughs> Anybody want to uh, uh, take a stab at that, Pedro? No? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it, it's, to have choice, you have to have information. You have to have access in terms of transportation. You have to, you, you have, to have the resources to exercise the choice. It also assumes that there's going to be lots of good choices. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem. There are limited good choices. So there's going to, uh, my experience uh, with my son when he was about to enter uh, high school, we went, sat down with the guidance counselor, gave us the big telephone-sized book of Manhattan high schools to choose from. I said, wow, this is overwhelming. She says, well, don't even worry about it. There's only 10 of them worth looking at. <laughs> I said, really, only 10? She said, just about. And then she, I said, which ones? She pointed out which ones. I said, what's gonna happen to all those other kids? She said, well, somebody's gonna lose out on this. Well. I, I'm gonna anticipate <laughs> Eric's response and say, <laughs> Uh, I, I, th there's also um, Claire, I, there's also a contradiction between there's, there's no choice is also inequitable. Well, I'm going to say this. I don't think that ten was right. Okay, but mm -hmm. she was talking to me as a middle class college educated yeah. professor mm -hmm. who what I would want from my kid, right. right? And she felt it was only ten. But no choice meant Thomas Jefferson for all the kids in East New York. That's true. Right, Eric. <laughs> uh, Clara. Clara. <laughs> When I was, Clara, when I was a deputy high school superintendent in the Bronx, there were, there were 20 high schools uh, for kids to choose from. Uh, there was Bronx Science, there were uh, 14 other uh, large academic comprehensive high schools, half of which were graduating barely a third of the schools, and there were five small schools. Today there are over 80 schools in that borough for parents to choose from. Uh, and there are some good choices, uh, at least 10, uh, Pedro, in that borough alone. Uh, and at the same time, there, there aren't enough good, good places for, uh, for all the parents to send kids at this point. And the job is to create uh, more and better and improve the schools that we have. Um, however, I don't think you can get to equity without choice. And part of the problem kids are entering into high schools is uh, without the skills that they require to succeed is because in, in this city, um, geography is destiny. Uh, and there are too many kids sentenced to the school closest to where they live, and that school may well turn out to be a failed elementary school. Uh, and they're not likely to succeed having no choices beyond that school. I think it's incumbent upon us to use choice to create more good options for more people in this city, and to use it to create pressure on the schools that aren't succeeding to either improve or create room for others to do a better job in their place. So, um, I, can I just add something on choice also? Oh, yeah, let's have Stephen Dutch and then uh, we'll finish up with Zakia, who uh, has either done it eight times or is about to do it eight times. <laughs> choice yeah. is great. I mean, it, 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 it's good that kids have so many options. But as we saw when Clara showed the 
labyrinth that parents and students must go through to be able to choose which high school is best for their child. It gets to the point of what Pedro mentions of someone saying to him, it's a big manual, you're only interested in 10. How well educated in the system was that person that was making that statement to him? And what did he or she base their decision on what made or didn't make a good school? Was it based on what the ethnic composition was of schools? What the economic conditions were of schools? And I think one of the things that lack is the information that middle schools have about what the high schools look like. And I'm not really sure how you could solve that since we have such a large choice catch pool of, of, of schools that kids can go to, but the counselors that are working with the parents do not really have the information at their fingertips about what the schools are like. They have not visited the schools. They probably don't even have the data on the schools to be able to make these, these decisions. Uh, the high school directory is cumbersome to use. The high school fairs are very large and, 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 and very, and it's a good thing, they're very crowded. But it is a very difficult way to make a decision also as to which school is best for an individual child. So those are things that are on the central level that need to be revisited on how middle school teachers and guidance counselors and principals begin to prepare families to make educated choices and educated decisions and not rely on this counselor who does not really know what the schools are like in Manhattan or Queens or the Bronx and based on some rubric that they've created in their own mind are advising parents which school is best for their particular child. Zakia. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to just, I mean, from personal experience, it's clear that for, to me that it's not the size of the school per se that, that is, makes it success, successful. Um, that, you know, it's what's happening in the school, it's how engaged parents and community are in the school, teachers and principal as well. Um, and I want to commend um, Pedro for having a guidance counselor that actually spoke to them and even <laughs> shared any information. Um, I, I want to um, say that, you know, this is just listening to the enorm enormity of this, what we're talking about as English speakers. You know, we're not talking about parents who are immigrants that come from this, com don't come from this country who are trying to navigate this system. Um, that want to talk to a guidance counselor and the guidance counselor may not speak the English, the, the language they need to be, uh, their child is translating it for them. It's, it's, it's enormous. And yet we expect parents to be engaged and we want parents to be involved. So we really need to address that as well. Um, we talk about, you know, Mr. Nadal started talking about, you know, being, it's frustrating to hear him say something like sentence to the school and their community. Well, the, the people in charge of make, ensuring that that school is successful is the Department of Education. So if that's a school in my community and, and I'm a non-English speaking parent and I think I'm coming to this country newly and I'm, my child is going to go to that school, I don't know that this school is not necessarily providing what needs to happen in that school. Um, so to hear that, I mean, you know, I, I'm willing to work and go, you know, over across the line 100% and I'm sure parents are across the city to ensure that those schools are successful, but we have to be met in the middle somewhere between those who are making the decision and us as parents and community members on that level. And just finally, just to say that, you know, this school system was based, you know, pretty much 100 years, kind of like 100 years old, and so it's about changing things that are happening in the school. It's about expanded learning time so that it's not just about remediation during the expanded learning time. It's that they're really getting enrichment programs that maybe the art and music that unfortunately they might not have gotten in during the school day is there. It's ensuring that our teachers that are teaching our kids have professional development that they are engaged in from the bottom down, not from the top down, that they are involved in creating themselves and that they are meeting daily on a daily basis to ensure that they're all on the same page and those kids that are really in trouble and really in need have someone that are connected to them, whether it's a large school, mid-sized school, and or small school. And most importantly, that there's really a commitment from the community 
of that school to engage parents actively. I don't care if you have 10 parents at a meeting. Make that the best darn meeting that you ever had. If you, there's different levels of involvement. I may not want to be the, the parent selling cookies at a bake sale. I may want to be the one sitting at a professional development meeting with other teachers hearing how you're going to engage our kids. But however parents want to be involved, we have to make sure that we have different tiers and different levels for them to be involved. Um, and I, I can, you know, not pretty much guarantee, but ensure that parents, when they are engaged, they will stay. If they feel that they are wanted in the school, they will stay. And just really finally, small schools, we don't get parent coordinators until we have 250 students in the school. So what happens to us the first year? What happens to us the second year if we don't have 250 parents? Where's that person that's going to bring parents together if there's not a parent coordinator in those buildings? So there's a lot of different issues, and it's not, again, the size of the school per se. I think it's what's happening within that school. We're out of time. I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to particularly thank the panel for uh, coming and offering their